Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Theology Talk here at Thoughtful Faith. This is a show where we explore both our own theology in the restored Church of Jesus Christ and the theology of others. I'm your host, Jacob Hansen, and joining me today is my co-host, Hayden Carroll. Hello. Uh, Also today, we have our very special guest, Todd McLaughlin. Now, Todd uh, founded the Joseph Smith Research Institute with Andrew E. Hatt and writes about LDS issues online, and his hope is to minister to those that are dealing with challenges to their faith and to, to keep them in the church. So welcome, Todd. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with both of you. Yeah, awesome. Well, as we kind of get into this, uh, first and foremost, for those who have no idea who you are, we've interacted with you quite a bit online in the Thoughtful Saints group mm-hmm. on, on Facebook. We chat sometimes there and have had a few phone calls even outside of that. But for those who don't kind of know anything about you, uh, give us a quick, uh, you know, three minute bio. Yeah, there's like not a lot to say about me, except I'm a pretty, pretty mainstream Mormon guy. Like, um, except for you use the word Mormon. So now you're outside the mainstream. I'm already non mainstream. <laughs> um, so I grew up at the church. I, um, I've always been very, very active and I served an LDS mission in Japan and it was a phenomenal experience. I came home, I taught in the MTC, which was just as equally as a good of experience for me personally. Um, I went to BYU, went to business school, uh, didn't get married till I was in my thirties. And so like in my twenties, um, so, so you were, so you were a menace according to Brigham Young. Yeah, I was a menace, and you know, like marriage didn't cure <laughs> it. So, <laughs> um, you're still a menace. Excellent. So, uh, you know, BYU, I studied philosophy mostly because I wanted to study from a, um, a philosophy professor. A lot of people might know, named Terry Warner. Um, very, very interested in self deception theory, and um, and so studying under Warner was extraordinarily influential in my life. Um, and then in my 20s, I've spent, you know, most of my life studying seriously the gospel. In my early 30s, I went through a faith crisis where um, I had some pretty sacred experiences in my 20s. But, um, you know, as a lot of people do, is they go through church history and they find out some things or some inconsistencies and things that they're disappointed to learn about or didn't understand. And it caused me to go into a deep, deep faith crisis, like a lot of people experience today. And in that process, I, I took it um, in pretty serious prayer. And I felt really directed to um, just go back to the origins in the beginning and start studying Joseph Smith. So that's what I did. And that took me on a, um, on a journey that was really unexpected. And I've never, I've never felt my testimony stronger than it is now. You know, this is 12, 13 years later. And I kind of feel like my life is dedicated to studying the gospel and helping people who are in faith crises to come through it and, um, and, and to go through it, but to go through it in a way, not just answering hard church history questions, which I'm interested in, but to do it in a way that they strengthen their faith in Christ and that they repent and that they experience the um the blessings of the gospel in in full so that's sort of my intent awesome well well, that's that's a quite an intention that you have there and i'm i'm in full support of it now you did you you had mentioned um that sometimes you feel like you get it from both sides that sometimes people that are within the church kind of feel like you're maybe a little off step when it comes to orthodoxy and then the people outside the church see you as a radical just like super faithful latter-day saint true mainstream mormon bender yeah just right yeah, the middle kind of guy. yeah like my views are, are you know and they are kind of a little bit unorthodox and um do you think that was necessary in order to help you through sort of the the challenges to your faith you know i'm trying to reconcile a lot of things at once i'm trying to reconcile um, scripture. I'm trying to reconcile church history. I'm trying to reconcile what's happening now in the church. Um, and just by exploring all those things, I'm, I'm just very, very interested in allowing the truth to truth to cut its way and to get clear and to experience the gospel. Like, for example, I believe the scriptures 
to the degree that I believe that they're actually giving you models of experience that should be being manifest in your life. Like, I don't think of them as being the outlier to experience that they're showing you patterns of what you can be and should be going through. So I'm asking questions like, how do we do that? And so the problem is, is there's a lot of people on the periphery who are also working that way and people I don't agree with or align with. Um, for example, like the Denver snuffer group, um, very, very much opposed, but people who listen to me will they'll say, well, you use terms like second comforter a lot. You must be a Denver snuffer guy. I'm like, no, I'm a Joseph Smith guy, <laughs> you know, or like the doctrine of Christ group, which frankly, a lot of those guys are my friends, but I'm completely not aligned. I don't agree mm -hmm. with a lot of what they uh, teach. For the viewers, the Doctrine of Christ group, right? Isn't that the group talking about the different theories of Joseph Smith's death in Carth Carthage? Is yeah, that the group? I completely reject that. Um, but I'm very much uh, a core to, I think, the fundamental um, doctrine of Christ in the scriptural way is becoming born again and experiencing things like a baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. So when I say that, people say, oh, you must be a Doctrine of Christ guy. I'm like, no, <laughs> um, I just believe in the scriptures. So it's, it's hard because it's easy to get pegged into like a periphery, a peripheral extremist group that is really antagonistic to the church because I'm actually really, really supportive of the main street church. But at the same time, my doctrinal views are, are pretty, are pretty um, unconventional. That's probably well, a fair way to put it. Well, today we wanted to delve into the topic of the priesthood. Um to be totally yeah. honest uh, with the viewers, there are some topics that I feel like I've delved into deeply and that I deeply understand. Um, and the priesthood one, like I'll give you all the answers that are on, you know, uh, church of Jesus Christ.org, you know, yeah. on the church's website. I, I know all those answers. I know the ones you give on the mission and stuff, but I've always felt like when I've studied the doctrine of the priesthood, that it's like, there's more there that like, like that it's a right. deeper doctrine than yeah. I'm kind of giving it like, I know that I have sort of the, the primary and maybe adolescent version of, but we all know that there's sort of more, as you grow up in the faith, you kind of get deeper understandings of what things are talking about. Yeah, and that right. things aren't quite as, that, not that they aren't true what you're told, but it's just like the story is a little more complicated, right? Yeah, totally. Um, it's like, and, I don't know, like growing up and even now, like when you hear um, like in lessons in church, I remember as a young man, like as a, in, a, in the priest quorum, them trying to teach like what the oath and covenant of the priest it is when they read DNC 84 and they teach the oath and covenant. And you're just like, I don't know, like it feels like everybody's like just kind of guessing on this one. Like everybody's trying to explain it, you know, like what it means to have your body renewed. And, you know, they're like, well, when you're a bishop, you know, you have extra energy, you know, and it's like, fair enough. That's, that's probably a true thing, but I don't think that's what it's talking about. But <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Like that's how I felt too. And um, I've had some really good experiences. I, I worked on these problems a long time and just, and, um, and like we were talking about before this, you know, you're never like at an end point. If, in fact, the more I learn, the more I feel like, oh my goodness, I'm just beginning. Like, I'm just, be I'm on the front end of learning about this thing. And in my life, especially in the last like five or six years, I look back every six months and I think, oh, I didn't know anything six months ago. Like, holy <laughs> smokes, like I didn't know anything six months ago. And so I know for a fact that in six months, like next winter, I'm going to look back on this interview saying, I are you even on that podcast? You didn't know anything, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, so. well, I hope what we can do is at least get like, like in this way, I, what I've found is that it isn't that the things it's sort of like if you were taught American history as a, in the second grade, you're going to get a story that's true, but it's not the whole story, yeah. right? It doesn't yeah. include all Fair the enough. richness and the dynamics. And, and, and the reality is anytime I, and I, and I say this kind of almost as a preface, just to, discussing theology in general okay like the deeper you get the less clear a lot of things become okay you yeah. know there there are things within the christian message that all christians can agree on but when you start getting more and more into details you find that every yeah. single one of us at some part we start to have our own ideas and 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 but those things naturally are um they're the details 
You know, they're, yeah. they're not, they're, they're, and, and I think it's okay to theologize and yeah. try and sort it out and have our own ideas about what things mean, but yeah. always tentatively, um, yeah. always with the, with the understanding that we could be wrong, that we could be corrected yes. and always, uh, you know, I, at least for myself, um, trying to be consistent with the collective witness of both scripture and living prophets. Yeah. So like, I always give this caveat that if I change my, I reserve the right to change my view tomorrow. Like if the Lord wants to tear down my understanding and build it back up again, sorry, just how, just how it works. You know, like I'm like, I, if I, if I call you tomorrow and say, Hey, I have a different view tomorrow that, that could happen. Like, definitely. Okay, I look at like, imagine like if you were, if you were born in a house without windows or doors and you never saw outside and the Lord came to you and said, Hey, there's big mountains outside your house. And you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And he's like, well, there's big rocks. And you're like, I don't even know what a rock is. And he's like, well, there's big triangles. And you're like, oh, I know what a triangle is. And then you like get excited and you build a religion around it. And you go and tell everybody <laughs> in your house, there's big triangles outside. And he comes back to you and says, well, they're not really triangles there. And he starts teaching you about what a mountain really is. Well, there's two things you could do. You could get mad and say, well, God just lied to me. Or you could understand that the Lord has to kind of shatter some concepts that you think are airtight in order to give you a fuller vision or picture of what the truth is. That's a, that's a perfect analogy. I really like that. I'm going to use that in the future, by the way. Go for it. So, My friends and I always refer to it as shattering triangle. So we'll, we'll always say, have a new triangle, knowing that it's a sharper picture. But the chance of that thing being broken down in the future is probably pretty likely. So. Hey, that's great. And I, I, I would say that's very much been my kind of journey of spiritual development and yeah. knowledge and things like that. So so let's talk cool. about the priesthood real quick. So okay. just just real quick, um, I know that you've had some very you've dealt you've delved very deeply into this topic. So just off the top of your head, we all know the primary answer to what the priesthood is. What what um so what do you say the priesthood is? Like, how would you sum okay, that up? Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite the listener to um, temporarily suspend the classic answer to what is the priesthood. And we're not going to invalidate it, but we're going to just kind of shelve it because it may not be the most useful way to think about priesthood. And that is the authority of God, you know, authority of God to operate on the earth. Or some as, a, as a preface, real quick, Todd, are you going to differentiate between priesthood and priesthood keys by chance? Is that part of this? Um, I could literally, I have 400 slides of building this whole thing out and could talk about 10 hours and priest and keys kicks in at about hour three or four. Um, <laughs> so absolutely we can do that. And that's, what's going to be challenging about this conversation is kind of talking through some, some concepts that would be really helpful if we were whiteboarding it. So we could pictorially mm -hmm. kind of see how it, but priest and keys is absolutely core but we're going to kind of build it out a little bit. And hopefully maybe I can paint a picture just by talking about it, at least on a, on a rudimentary way. To okay. hopefully make so, sense. so let's just so start let's with, the, with priesthood as a general concept. Okay. So priesthood and I, and I'm, I'm a philosophy guy. Like, my, like my degrees in philosophy, I really believe that the more precise you can lay a foundation, the better off you're going to be. And you know, if you build on one, if you build on one plus one equals three, it might work for a day or two. But once you get into algebra, that really complicates algebra. So if you come back and you get the math right in the beginning, it makes everything that seems really hard actually way easier down the road. So the fundamental definition of priesthood is priesthood is an order. Um it's an order. It's an order of individuals. And what an order is, is a group of people with a shared characteristic. So just like a neighborhood is a group of neighbors or a sisterhood is a group of sisters or what else ends with hood? Um, you know, no, that, I'm, that makes sense. Those are good analogies. I like that. Like you literally, when you get like uh, a college degree, you put a hood on, that's where that hood comes from. Right. Like, um, um, Hugh Nibley talks about that. So priesthood is a, is an organization of priests, um, or those who have the priestly characteristics. So a priesthood is literally an organization or an association of, of 
of individuals. And, um, you know, Joseph Smith taught that all priesthood is Melchizedek, and there's just portions or degrees of it. So Levitical or Aaronic priesthood is part of the overarching Melchizedek priesthood, but it's a portion of it. And it's the portion that um, deals with the outward ordinances or the outward performances of the priesthood. So priesthood is an order. And an order follows a pattern. So the question is, is, and I'm going to be a little bit imprecise here because the depth of this is like mind boggling because it's the order after the son of God, right? So like we know from DNC 107, that's actually the actual definition of priesthood, right? Um, the name, I'm sorry, not the definition, but the name of it. So for example, like if you go into the Book of Mormon and you look up the term priesthood, I think it's only in there like a couple of times. Like you'll see the word priesthood maybe like one or two times, I think. You could probably do it right now and find out. But if you look up order, you're going to see it all over the place. And once you realize when it says the after the order of God, you realize that the Book of Mormon is full of priesthood doctrine. Um, it's just that it's important to understand what the priesthood is and is it how it, scriptures it, talk about it. Just as a quick thing, and I, I'm I'm following what you're saying, and I actually really like it. I'm just wondering, is this because a lot of times a word can have different meanings in different mm -hmm. contexts, right? So yeah. is it possible that priesthood could refer to this order of of people, let's say, mm -hmm. and also to maybe more traditional notions? Yeah, kind of. Uh, or maybe this is, and I don't know if this is even necessary conflicts with traditional notions of priesthood, but but yeah, I think so it's... Like, yeah, like, um, this is such a broad topic. We really could do like a 20 hours on this. So I have to be really careful and make sure we keep it crisp and like organized. No, that's fine. Um, so like usually the one of the definitions is that it's power. I want to be really like kind of like kind of hit this on the head that technically there's no such thing as priesthood power. There is the power of God. However, you, in, in, in the various ways you can describe that, like um, DNC 88 would talk about light and truth, you know, maybe being the mm -hmm. overall structure of eternity, the power of God that holds everything up. Light is law. You know, there's the power mm -hmm. of God. We, we, we sometimes we conflate this idea with priesthood and power, not sometimes like all the time, but really what priesthood is, it's, it's the order of, after the son of God. And as you fulfill these different patterns of orders, depending on what orders you're fulfilling, you are accessing the power of God. So that's why it's easily conflatable. Um, it's not that there's no power, but it's just, there's no such thing as there's not like an ethereal power hanging up in the cosmos called priesthood. And men who have ordination have access to this cosmic priesthood power no there's just the power of god and as you fulfill various orders within his priesthood you have access to it so that's i i, I find that really compelling um yeah, so yeah. one <laughs> thing is we do we do talk about the idea of priesthood office yeah mm -hmm. priesthood power and then the priesthood yeah and then priesthood keys so yeah. it, it's funny because these things are all distinct things. But what you're saying, if not, let me see if I understand this right, is that these are all appendages of the order mm -hmm. um, of God. Yeah. And we are to part, we access his power through conforming ourselves to this order. Yes, yes. And when we conform with that order through our office that we've been assigned or keys to Hayden's or, through, or through the exercise of the keys that we have, yeah. mm -hmm. we can then access his power through us, which power exactly. we would call priesthood power because it's power yeah. that's accessed. God's power. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, priesthood power because it's the power that's accessed by participation in the order. Is that a yeah, fair way so of putting it? Yeah, I think it's pretty close. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty close. So like offices have direct purposes. Keys have direct purposes. Um, sometimes it's helpful to work from the top down a little bit. And so we can ask ourselves, and this is going to be a little bit imprecise, but like what is the ultimate pattern of the priesthood? And the ultimate pattern is 
to become a high priest or a high priestess. In the DNC, it says in the church of the firstborn, but let's just say high priest and high priestess. And what a high priest and high priestess is, is think about the Old Testament temple. So what's happening? What is the high priest doing once a year in the Old Testament temple? He's hey, I'll let you answer that one. Offering sacrifice on behalf of the people. He's offering sacrifice. And where is he going into? The Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies. And and so let's so let's talk about real quickly what a holy of holies is. Like, if you had to put definition around that, Hayden, like what would you? How would you define the holy of holies? I think I'm not I'm not super read up on my Greek and Hebrew, but I think the idea is the place where God dwells. Is that right? Yeah, totally. So it's sort of the intersection of heaven and earth. So like if you think about Adam and Eve, they're in the presence of the Father, the Lord, and they. They separate out and they, you know, they go through a fall and the whole idea of the plan of redemption, the plan of salvation is to come back and reclaim that presence and that unity with, with, with our heavenly parents. That is the definition of going back into the presence of the Lord is the definition of fulfilling the holy order. So priesthood, the order of the priesthood to become a high priest and a high priestess is someone who enters into the holy of holies both physically and spiritually, which means they're coming back into the presence of the Father while in the flesh, in mortality. That is the ultimate manifestation of the fulfillment of the order of the priesthood. Okay. And it is and, and uh, this uh, and this this turns back to maybe sort of the the concept of those who the Lord can't like the veil can't help, but be rent like maybe a brother yeah. Jared type experience where, where someone it's like, I can't hide myself from you. The Lord becomes manifest to someone in the flesh due to a, uh, basically a conformance with that order. Or we might even talk about notions of, of translation. Uh, and, and, yeah. and these, I'm just seeing a corollary here. If I'm not mistaken, between conformance with the order of God and that resulting in a you know a second anointing a, 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 a direct encounter with the with the divine 100 percent yeah and like if we were to go down that vein we would the three of us would quickly identify a thousand places in the scriptures where that pattern is manifest right like it's I mean, in one sense, that is the purpose of the scripture is to give us the pattern of how to enter into the presence of the Lord over and over and over and over and over. So does that mean that any of us who have not had a personal direct encounter with the Savior in something like the a second mm -hmm. anointing, does that mean that we are unfaithful and, you know, we're, we're slothful servants who have not uh, attained that and that our goal in life should be to try to have an actual encounter with the Savior and mortality? Yeah, so we just have to be really careful kind of how we talk about it, right? Because the answer to that is yes, but we but we sort of have to be careful. So meaning this, um, let's kind of put a pin in the idea of the second anointing um, because we can come back to that when we can talk about temples. But let's just talk about the pattern as manifest in the scriptures. So, yeah. So like you just brought up um, the brother of Jared, right? I think you just kind of um, quoted him, right? Uh, the Ether 4 experience. And when Moroni is going through Ether 4 about the brother of Jared, he literally says, you know, all ye Gentiles, if you'll come unto me as the brother of Jared did, then you will see those things that the brother, you know, you'll see all the things the brother Jared saw. You'll have the same manifestation. And if you don't, you'll be under condemnation, right? It's because of, of because you've hardened your heart. So he actually introduces this idea of a hardened heart and a softened heart into this ether four. It'd be easier if we were looking at the scriptures together and we could kind of kind of talk through it. Um, but if you want me to pull them up? I, I can actually pull them up and share them if you if you. Oh yeah, want yeah. Pull up, pull up ether four. That'd be fantastic. Okay, so while I pull that up, uh, go ahead and keep going here. Um, okay, so then you then you jump to third Nephi twenty six and the. And the Lord specific, the Lord directly says the same thing. He says, um, I think it's in 26. 
I'm sure it is. He says, if you, I'm going to try your faith with the lesser portion of the Book of Mormon. And if you don't get the greater portion, you'll be under condemnation. It's because you're under condemnation. Greater portion being the same type of blessing and manifestation that the brother of Jared's talking about in Ether 4. So there's Thanks just two examples. Yeah, so let's, okay, let's, let's, let's pull up Ether 4 here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom in some on this. Bring it up a little closer. Um, so Ether 4, what verse you want to go to? Let's scroll down a little bit. Okay, right over there. Um, go up a little bit. Sorry, okay. go up like a uh, back. Uh, is... Here's the Cumio Gentiles. Yeah, but there's a little more before that, I think. So go up a okay. little more. Okay. Yeah. Let's do. Um. Let's do. Let's start with six there. Okay. For the Lord said unto me, They shall not go forth unto the Gentiles until the day that they shall repent of their iniquity and become clean before the Lord. And in that day that they shall exercise faith in me, saith the Lord, even as the brother of Jared did, that they may become sanctified in me. Then will I manifest to, unto them the things which the brother of Jared saw, even unto the unfolding unto them all my revelations, saith Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of the heavens and the earth and all things that in them are. You can tell me when to stop. And I mean, yeah, that's a good place. Um, okay. I'm sure there's more in there. But I mean, anyway, basically, yeah, you be saying what, what you had just covered. I mean. Yeah, you get the idea, right? Like it's, and it it's, says, it's, interesting, I, look at verse 9. It says, you know, at my command are the heavens opened and are shut. And at my word, the earth shall shake. And at my command, the inhabitants thereof shall pass away, even so as by fire. Yeah. And he that believeth not the words of my disciples, believeth not, uh, I'm sorry, be believeth not my words, believeth not my disciples. And if it so be that I do not speak, judge ye, for ye shall know it is I that speaketh at the last day. But he that believeth these things which I have spoken, him I will visit with the manifestations of my spirit, and he shall know and bear record. For because of my spirit, he shall know that these things are true. For it persuadeth men to do good. So good, isn't it? Like it's so powerful. Interesting here. 13. 13 yeah. uh, let me read 13 real quick. Come unto me, O ye Gentiles, and I will show unto you the greater things, the knowledge which is hid up because of unbelief. Yeah. It's so rich. Look at 15. Oh, I'll go back. Pull it up here. 15 says, But when ye shall rend that veil of unbelief, which doth cause you to remain in your awful state of wickedness and hardness of heart and blindness of mind, then, ye sh uh, then shall the great and marvelous things which have been hid up from the foundation of the world, uh, the foundation of the world from you, yea, when ye shall call upon the Father in my name with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, then shall ye know that the father hath remembered his covenant, which was made unto your fathers, O house of Israel. Yeah. That's so powerful. <laughs> so, so I want to real quick, not necessarily push back, but I, I, I look at these verses and I definitely see where a person can, can say, look, you know, brother Jared had a, had a, an actual, you know, quote unquote, second anointing, a, 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 a an actual, visitation in the flesh from the Lord. Is it possible though, to interpret these verses as a, a witness of testimony through the spirit rather than an actual in-person manifestation and that the deep things of God can be revealed to us, but it doesn't necessarily have to entail a, uh, a an actual physical visitation. Yeah, so um, this is a really, really good question. And in this conversation, it may be a good timely place to, to do that. Um, so when we're talking about priesthood being an order and the height or the full manifestation of, of at least that order on this earth is to come into the presence of the Lord, it's, it's a process that you're going through of receiving 
in one way of saying it, orders of the priesthood, meaning you're fulfilling patterns in preparation for that ultimate culminating experience of being in his presence and receiving all that he has. Now, now can I, can I real quickly just hit something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree uh, from the perspective of, I do believe that conformance with the order of the priesthood brings you into the presence of the Lord, mm -hmm. right? Like that, I think that is just <clears throat> without denial, that is what the temple centers around that, that that's what these, mm -hmm. these things do. I guess sort of the only area that I, I look at this and kind of go, Hmm, I don't know that it means that it has to be in the flesh in this life, though. I agree. Mm -hmm. There are definitely scriptural examples of that because yeah, there's, right. I, I could, I'm just looking at it, seeing that, is there a way to read this in which this is all a, let's say a theological roadmap for, returning to the presence of God through conformance to the order of the priesthood. Yeah. But that it doesn't necessarily entail that it, that something either has to, or will happen in, in the flesh, not, and I'm not denying that those things can't possibly happen. Right. Well, you know, this is maybe a good time to, to jump to the Moses story, the Moses account, um, particularly as it's uh, presented in DNC 84. And what we all grew up, we all grew up, not even grew up, even now, like if you were in Elders Quorum and you someone said, hey, where's the oath and covenant of the priesthood? Everyone would raise their hands or well, people who would think they would know would say DNC 84, right? Like that's the standard. That's where the oath and covenant is. So this is, you know, I'm going to push into some unorthodox view territory here. Just a heads up. Um <laughs> I don't believe that the DNC 84 is the oath and covenant of the priesthood. I believe it's talking about it. It's referencing the oath and covenant. It's teaching about it, but it's not the actual oath and covenant. Um, that the oath and covenant of the priesthood is actually the temple endowment. So that's where you get all of the covenants and you receive and make the oaths of the priesthood. It's, it's literally a priesthood endowment. Um, and so when... Moses, and we can read it if you want to in DNC 84, but we are all familiar with the story. You know, I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, I know you guys are, um, but Moses, um, you know, in Moses one, Moses chapter one, which is essentially like Genesis chapter zero, <laughs> right? Like it's the, it's the yeah. precursor to Genesis. It's where he actually gets Genesis and vision. Mm -hmm. He comes into the presence of the Lord and he has, and has his, fullness of the Lord ex experience he experiences him. He's given a name. Um, I'm sorry. He's given a witness of who he is. Then he goes to this condescension where he has to face the adversary. We're familiar with that account, right? Like where the hell opens up and he appears into it and he shakes and well, it's, you know, where Moses, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around a lot, but I'm assuming maybe the listener is kind of familiar with Moses chapter one, right? So he comes off the mountain. He's left unto his own strength. He says, man is nothing that which thing I never had supposed. And Satan comes to him saying, Moses, son of man, worship me. And then he says, who art thou that I should worship thee? For I am a son of God. And I couldn't look upon God, save I are changed before him. But I can look upon me in the natural eye. Is it not so surely? So he, he rebukes the adversary, but the adversary is persistent. And Moses sort of, I don't know, maybe yields in a way or allows it to <laughs> overtake him a little bit. He's terrified. He looks into the depths of hell. And then he, you know, he says something to the effect of, I have more to inquire of my father. So he's able to overcome this experience. And then he's back into the presence of the Lord. And then the Lord grants him a blessing. He says, Moses, you will command the, the many waters as if that were God. He gives him this blessing. And it's a covenantal blessing. It's, it's associated with the sealing power. Um, and like, like you brought up the second anointing, which we can come back to it when we talk about the temple. So Moses gets this experience. He has this ascension. And then he goes back to Egypt with the intent of, of bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt into the wilderness with the intent of bringing them up the mount to have the same ascension. So he brings them to the base of Sinai. And he's preparing them. And they're going through what the scriptures call the provocations, right? They're angering the Lord um, because of their lack of faith. And the great provocation of not 
going up the mount into the presence of the Lord, where DNC 84 literally says into um, the presence of the Lord while in the flesh, <laughs> right? Like mm -hmm. the children of Israel, are, they're afraid and they say, we want Moses to go on our behalf. Um, and we, so we don't go because they're afraid. Well, this is the event that triggers the Lord to what? R remove the Melchizedek priesthood, which is the power and the pattern to come into the presence of the Lord in the flesh. And this is why they get Levitical, the lesser, the lesser priesthood. Because mm -hmm. the Lord is basically like, hey, if you're not going to do this, if you're not going to exercise faith to come into my presence and receive what I have to give you, which is the fullness of my priesthood, mm -hmm. I'm going to give you forms that are outward that if you practice them and you're smart and you, you pay attention to what you're doing, it's going to teach you the patterns of what you can actually do in, in spiritual reality. Uh, uh, it's a preparatory priesthood. It is. Uh, so, so the idea here, let's, let me, let me see if I can kind of just sum up what we've talked about so far. So the idea here is, is that doctrine and covenants 84 people, a lot of times think that is the oath and covenant of the priesthood. But yeah. your argument is, is that actually it is, it's, section 84 is actually a description of it's talking what about the it. oath it, it talks about the oath and covenant yeah. of the priesthood but the actual oath and covenant of the priesthood are the temple ordinances in mm -hmm. which we bring ourselves into conformance with the order of heaven yep. and thus through those ordinances and through the temple ceremony within its own liturgy as it were uh, yep. it walks us back to the presence of the father by conforming ourselves with the order with essentially the celestial what we might call the celestial order of being which would be yeah. the the melchizedek priesthood yeah. but the children of israel and and we look if we look to the scriptures moses is essentially you know has the melchizedek priesthood is able to enter into the presence of god while in the flesh and then uh but the people are unwilling to do that they're not yes. willing to conform themselves and to purify themselves in such a way to be able to be worthy to enter into the presence of the Lord. And so God gives them the Levitical priesthood in order to um, uh, basically prepare, prepare them, them to, give take them the a people, uh, to take a, a wild and rebellious people, to give them, uh, you know, not cast the pearls before the swine, uh, yeah. to give them milk before he gives them the meat. And, and from there, um, that's kind of where we're at in this story. So, so continue kind of. Yeah, can, I ask one, can I ask just one question real quick? Yeah, go ahead. And, yeah. and I, not, I don't want to derail it. So if, if you were going to come back to this, let me know. Sure. So, so does this oath and covenant of the priesthood, does it apply to women in any sense? Because they also are endowed. Boom. But they don't have a priesthood office. So <laughs> is that like for, for the, for the females who are watching this, like. And I don't know if we'll come back in. to this point or how does that affect them? Let's jump in. So um, I'd like to show you a bunch of slides, but let me just talk through it and try to draw it out pictorially to just do words. When Moses wanted to create a nation of priests, right? He Remember, he says things like, I wish all men were prophets, right? Or I'm going to create a nation of priests. Um, and a priest being, remember in the beginning, Hayden, we kind of mentioned that like a high priest goes into the Holy of Holies. And a Holy of Holies is where heaven and earth meet. It's the holy space. It's, it's the combining of the two where the presence of the Lord is established on the earth. And this is what saves the earth is that there's holy space that the Lord can come to. And a high priest is somebody who enters into that space in both spiritual and physical communion with the Lord. It's very it's extraordinary, powerful. Um, Joseph Smith, when he restored, you know, when he's going through the his portion of the restoration, meets with the Relief Society sisters, and there's multiple accounts of him saying, I'm going to make you a, a, a society of high priestesses, or high pre, you know, or a nation of high priestesses, along with the brothers who will be a nation of high priests. He truly is like the modern Moses is Joseph Smith because I, I was going to, I was going to say just, just a quick side note on that. Yeah. 
I recently studied Joseph Smith's history in, in great detail. When we did yeah, the I saw that you wrote about that. Yeah. I went and went through it in, 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 in a lot of detail. And what really fascinated me about his story, when you get away from all the, the episodes in his life of things that people all like talk all about, is to yeah. actually look at his whole life and what he what was he actually doing? Like right. a huge thing he was dedicated to was a was was both a study and then the translation you know, or what you might call an yeah. inspired uh, uh, revelation of the book of Moses and yeah. sort of the mosaic and Abrahamic sort of stories. Like Joseph spent, it's interesting, he didn't spend his time in the New Testament per se. He spent his yeah. time looking at the Old Testament and really deeply looking into all these things that we're talking about right now, yeah. when it came to these ideas of that, there was something in the Christian tradition that from what I can tell was lost that yeah. connected the new Testament sort of Christianity to the old Testament religion. And yeah. Joseph more than anyone else that I <laughs> saw the whole picture. Seen, Exactly. He 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 yeah. came out and and brings forth this this bigger vision. And Moses obviously is a critical figure in this. And so mm -hmm. what you're saying is is that obviously this is why Moses is such a critical figure. Yes. And why it's so critical to the entire notion of what the restoration was all about. Yes. I mean, this is why Moses is restoring the key of the uh, gathering of Israel. The gathering of Israel is to gather them into the presence of the Lord. Hmm. Like it's. Like there's all these things that come together once you kind of see what this whole thing is supposed to be, right? Like, and to your point about, you're exactly right about Old Testament. It's amazing how much he would draw on that. And that would become a core of his, of his, of his ministry. But he's also connecting the book of Hebrews into that and Romans in ways that's like mind block boggling. And in the book of Mormon, like these scriptures are so cohesive in the DNC, like in 84, like, I'm sorry to ramble, but let me just go on another little side to kind of prove, like, Joseph Smith is not even a genius. He's a prophet. Like, a genius couldn't do this. Yeah, no, that, 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 the, the coherence part of it, like, the fact Impossible. that this all does, this all does mesh into an incredibly totally. interesting, sophisticated, powerful message that, that, like, when you, it creates a vision of eternity and a vision of, and, and, and it's weird because what's really wild is, is when you look at the book of Mormon and how it came about and the time frame that it came about yeah. and the way and, and how early in his theological sort of development it mm -hmm. came out. But the way that it all jives is just like, it's incredible. It's wild. like, go read the DNC so 84. Like, everyone needs to like pause. Anyone who really understands Joseph yeah. Smith, like <laughs> these are big testimony builders for me because it's they like, really are. Me too. Like I, like, I just whoa. I read the Book of Mormon. I just hold my head. Like I cannot believe the depth of theology, the depth of power. What he put in, what what he translated. You look at DNC eighty four, and, and it defines rest. You know, R E S T rest as coming into the presence of the Lord. So it gives you a definition of rest. Then you jump to Jacob and Jacob is talking about coming into the rest of the Lord. And he says things like, and let us not bring on the provocation as the children of Israel did. Like he's the connection to 84 is like airtight. And then you jump to Alma 12 and Alma 13, when it's also talking about the high priests. And when we know what the high priest is, is talking about them coming into the rest of the Lord and then giving a pattern on how, everybody can come into the rest and all of a sudden you you start to get this vision of why they say the fullness of the gospel is in the uh, in the book of mormon even though it leaves out a lot of details of, of what we would consider key ordinances um and it's because it outlines with more clarity than anything else the patterns of how to come into the lord's presence and and for example like i'm sorry i'm rambling but let's get back to no, the temple good. and we'll connect it to the book of mormon here when Lehi and Nephi have their visions of the tree of life, those are straight up endowments. Hmm. Like, How so? Well, I just walk through, walk through the presentation of the endowment. Um, you're going from the broad path, which is the telestial world, 
And okay, so let's let's connect three things at once if we can. I have a slide to take you through that's really helpful, but let's just do think of three columns. You have let's just call it Nephi's dream, even though it's Lehi and Nephi. Nephi's dream. You have the temple endowment, and then you have first Nephi 31, like in 32. Because second Nephi 31 and 32 are the doctrinal explanations of the dreams. He's giving you the doctrinal interpretation of his dreams, right? Mm -hmm. He's describing what exactly the paths are. What's the straight and narrow path? What's the gate? What's the tree of life, right? Like he's giving you. So the endowment is the same thing. So the telestial world is the world that obviously we, we live in, exist in, that we're experiencing as a default. But we one thing that's really helpful to do is think about telestial, terrestrial, and celestial as covenant states of being or, or natures. Like so that. what I mean by that is when you're in the telestial world, you're in a telestial covenant structure, which basically, and this is this point I think is worthy of like an hour conversation. So I'm going to do it really fast. <laughs> which basically means, hey, we're all down here. The light of Christ shines down upon everybody. If we, through our conscience, yield to the light of Christ, we increase in a little bit more light. If we resist it, we lose light. But ultimately, everybody dies. And if you don't come to Christ, you can receive goodness, but you're going to not be in a state of redemption. And it's so it's a state of death, decay, and entropy. That's the telestial world, right? Fair, fair enough. Mm -hmm. It, this is also the world in which the Aaronic priesthood exists. Because the Aaronic priesthood does not have power to exalt you or even give you the gift of the Holy Ghost, right? Like it's the outward forms. It's the, um, it's the, to sum it up, what you're, if I, if I'm understanding you right, it's that the, the telestial world is sort of the temporal world. It's it's the world we exist in now. We, we yeah. are living in a it's your default world here. Yeah. It, yeah, it's the default sort of setting uh, level of existence that you're at. Yes. And at that mm -hmm. level, the the temporal is ultimately very much what you're dealing with. And the Aaronic priesthood is very much uh, the temporal side yeah. of the of the uh of the priesthood structure yeah uh, of the priesthood order let me give you an example that may that hopefully kind of takes us home just a little bit hayden let's say that you uh, went out and cheated on your wife on saturday heaven forbid i know you would never do that <laughs> you cheat on your wife and on sunday you go baptize some guy and on monday they find out you cheated on your wife on saturday does that invalidate that guy's baptism? Traditionally, we'd say no. Yeah, and I, and I think that's true. Like, there's technically no worthiness requirements for the Aaronic priesthood. Like, we don't want to say that because you want everybody to, to live, quote unquote, worthily. But you're not going to invalidate an ordinance. Does that, does that make sense? It kind of, yeah, kind same, of same, same with the sacrament. I mean, how many sacraments yeah. are blessed unworthily every Sunday? Right. Un it unworthily, I guess, if they're if we're going to, you know, give the idea that there needs to be a worthiness. But what you're saying is that there's not a requirement. Right. So and, and would you would you say that that modern day I, prophets I, either. Oh, oh, sorry. Go oh, ahead. Hayden. Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, are, you, are you saying that like so, for example, do you think President Nelson and the Quorum of the Twelve and the First Presidency would agree with you there or are they mistaken? Would you say or what's your take? On I have that? no idea. Like, yeah. I don't, you know. Not a lot said. Like I read everything that I can find that they say on these things. I don't, I don't know. I don't want to put words in their mouths, nor do I want to assume one way or the other. Right? Like. So um, you're, you're saying though that there that there isn't a worthiness requirement. I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to sort that out because there is a worthiness requirement for the one performing the ordinance. The thing is that if someone performs an ordinance unworthily, the ordinance still is binding yeah. on the person who receives the ordinance. Yeah. So this is why we're going to get into some technical space and this would be good to write it out. So in the ironic level, you're just binding on earth, right? So like, think about like, what did Joseph Smith say about baptism? That if it's just a water baptism, you might as well baptize a bag of sand, right? Without the gift of the Holy ghost. So baptism is really interesting because baptism 
what we consider the full of that fullness of that ordinance is both the water baptism and the baptism of spirit or the, or the um, uh, baptism of fire and the Holy ghost. Right. So Together, the idea being that, uh, what's that? So, so, so let me see if I see where you're kind of going with this. It's the idea that the, the baptism of water is essentially Portion. a temporal manifestation. Right. It's a, it's a symbolic ordinance in symbol only without any sort of effective spiritual power per se. It's like signing a contract. However, so, yeah. the, the, the baptism of fire it's and the Holy Ghost and the sealing power associated with that, yeah. that binds not only on earth as a temporal sort of contract, but in heaven as a, okay. an actual covenant between you and God. Is so we're gonna like going to end that because I have a very unorthodox view about the quote unquote, we're using the word sealing. Because okay. um, we've sort of, and this is this is one of those things we have to let's let's pin it and come back to it because I don't believe that the Holy Spirit of promise is a conditional seal. I think we actually use that term, unfortunately, inappropriately. Okay. Um, but we let's pin it and come back to it. Um, I just kind of make one comment about what Jacob said. Uh, th this kind of makes sense to me in the sense that a lot of people believe and maybe at one time i believe that when we are baptized our sins are washed away but other scripture would say that it's by the holy ghost that we are sanctified not by the water yes uh, so maybe that makes sense that the baptism kind of like joseph said it doesn't really do anything until the melchizedek priesthood keys right because you can't be a priest and ordain someone yeah or, but I, but, but right? can i can i really quickly interject something there i think that it would matter. It does matter in a temporal sense, right? Like it's not that the temporal things that we do don't matter in, in this sense that like, um, you know, it is an act uh, like that you're actually doing yourself. It It is a, how do I explain it? It's like temporal things matter. Like we do need to take care of the poor and make sure that people eat. You know, uh, like you can't just get, you can't just get confirmed without baptism, right? You need. Yeah, we're, we're not we're not pure spiritualists. I think one of the really interesting things about our theology and the theology of Joseph Smith was the merger between both the spiritual and the temporal Amen. as as together. And Amen. and if you, Todd, maybe want to yes. say that that we could talk about those two aspects of our uh, of our spiritual life within the priesthood as yeah. both the temporal meaning the the ironic aspect of our priesthood and then the temp the spiritual being the melchizedek aspect of our priesthood but that both are necessary in order to fully yeah. exalt the being and i would love to come back and talk about baptism because i think it's a critical thing to discuss but to your point what you just said it's the crossover from the ironic to the melchizedek right you have the ironic portion and you have a melchizedek portion what comes together to make one fulfilled ordinance because you need the Melchizedek priesthood to give the, the gift of the Holy ghost. Right. So in the temple endowment, in we're, the we're, Iraq just, portion, just to pause oh, before ahead. we go on to the, the temple endowment thing, I, I just want to, I just want to point out something that I think, I think this is all very profound in, in a lot of ways in that um, the Aaronic priesthood and the Melchizedek priesthood are both necessary parts of our our process of exaltation and so this is not oh, purely yeah. a spiritual journey per se joseph it's, smith is a materialist yes and he is and he's yeah. very much concerned about the the physical nature which is something that's really interesting when you get into the doctrines of the resurrection and all the rest of it i mean we this is why we, the second comforter is so critical and so, and, and so that is a, um, I just want to want to say that there's an element of that, that, I don't know, I just think it's very important to, to re-emphasize home to the listener and, and even just for my own sake, that if the, if the celestial order of being is what we're after, that celestial order of being includes both physical i.e. temporal, ironic, and a Melchizedek aspect. 
So yeah. the celestial order of being is not purely a spiritual thing. It is a it is the perfect union of the two. Yeah, because the celestial is the fullness of the of fulfilling the order, right? Of after the pattern of the Son of God, and to get to that pattern, you have to fulfill all of the orders that bring you into it. And the ironic or the Levit or the outward performances is actually going to be. So and, we that, and real quick, I'm going to pause on that. Yeah. The outward, you just said it, the outward performances. Because our thing is, is that we oftentimes get hung up in the, well, well, either way, people say, why do outward performances matter? And yeah, then other people right. say, yeah, where, where they're like, well, if you did the outward performance, it's sort of like the old Jews, like you're good. You did the outward performance. It's all good. Where what we're saying is, is that the outward performance matters, ironic, but that the spiritual side of it matters as well. Yes. The Melchizedek. And I, frankly, that resonates with me in all sorts of ways, because that explains why it matters. And I often tell people like, you know, a person who doesn't want to live worthy of being in the temple yeah. to participate in the sealing of their child to their spouse, that is an outward manifestation of their inward state yeah. in their relationship towards God. And that these outward manifestations actually matter. Like, okay, so I'm going to suggest a, a definite, and I, I know this is bold and maybe even arrogant, but I'm going to suggest a definition of an ordinance. This is a non-scriptural definition, but I think I can make the case for it in the scriptures. And that is, an ordinance is, is when something on earth takes its heavenly form. So something on earth is transformed into a the heavenly form of that thing. Okay, let me, let me, let me, let me rephrase that in a way that I think, because I've thought of something similar. Okay. As on earth, so in heaven. Oftentimes I think about the ordinance and the ordinances and the institution of the church is to demonstrate to us a pattern of being yeah. that through the ordinances are manifest the celestial order of being. Okay, and then exactly we conform, right. we conform. And, and so that's why they matter is because they are almost like a language of God that is literally allowing us to embody through ritual. The only so way I can, I can, I can align it with is it? like signing a contract. Like I, I could just make like, you know, we could have a verbal agreement, but the actual act of signing the contract does something. It's, so it's like, a physical manifestation of, a, of an inward thing. Yeah, if you have like a physical ordinance, how, and that's how we normally think of it as like a physical act, right? Anything that's in the Melchizedek portion is both a spiritual revelatory and a physical. And until you have both, you actually don't have an ordinance yet. Hmm. Which means that you can go, like, for example, like probably 100% of the people who go through and receive their quote-unquote endowment the endowment is actually the second comfort. It's the calling and election made sure ordinance. Like the presentation of the endowment. But, but no one's getting their calling and election made sure. Let me, let, me, let me explain what I mean by that. When you go to the veil of the temple, I think it's commonly thought, maybe like assumptive, that the veil of the temple is death. You're passing through death, right? Into the next world. Mm -hmm. But the veil of the temple is passing into the presence of the Lord while in mortality it's the moses experience it's coming to the top of the mountain could it be both i mean could it be well i mean we all will ultimately be brought into the presence of the lord but this is so, allowing us to enter the presence of the lord in a state that is that we're prepared to enter into the presence of the Lord rather yeah. than to, you know, I don't want to get into this rabbit hole too much because it's going to require us to build out a whole lot of stuff. But let me just That's say right. this. No, no, I'll, I'll, well, I'll Neil I'll, Maxwell I'll, I'll said that the that. veil may not be lifted into you till long after your death. Hmm. So until you fulfill the terms of your probation, which is you are prepared and sanctified to go into the presence of the Lord, your endowment's not complete. So the idea of the veil is going into his presence in the same way that in the Moses pattern. That's what he's setting up is the endowment is, is giving you the, the covenants to prepare you to bring you actually into the presence. So you are being so so let me see if I kind of understand this. So 
the idea yeah. of the endowment is that you are being endowed. We're being the word endowment means like a gift, right? You are yeah. being gifted all that you need to enter back into the Lord's presence. And you could say in mortality. Yeah. I, I may say, yeah, I think there's a case to be made there that, that is a possibility. Yeah, that's a separate um, discussion. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, but, isn't isn't that but, what the second endowment is? Is okay. that representative? So, I mean, second of that? anointing. Well, so let's talk second endowment, that second anointing, same thing almost, right? If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and hit the subscribe button. Also, if you want more content, including the podcast, go to thoughtful-faith.com. Thanks for watching.